Now, is anybody here who does not like bread? So I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. But the problem is sometimes the choir people get confused. And a lot of people, I'm sure, are here because they like bread, but they don't know what's happening with bread. Matter of fact, they probably don't even know if they're eating bread. They're eating something, a facsimile. See, bread is evolved in history to something that we have now in so many varieties, but some of it is not even bread. It just looks like bread. So my purpose today is to try to teach you a little bit about bread so you can make your own decisions, educated decisions, because the, the industry, the media, have managed to confuse us all. And really it's difficult. When I read articles, you know, I was just reading an article this week and I said, you know, how did this person arrive to these conclusions? I mean, it's, it's amazing. So, but okay, we, we work with what we have. So in order to find out where we are, we need to go back and see how we got here and what happened along the way. So when did bread start? When this is in history, who was the bread maker that originated? Hmm? <laughs> How long ago do you think? 5,000 years. Good guess. And that was true until last year. Yes, but now it's 15,000 years. They found some evidence of bread baking in Jordan, in, and it's 16,000 years old. So bread's been around for a long, long time. And it's also evolved, and it had a lot of time to evolve into what we know today. Of course, when things are evolving, sometimes they don't go in the right direction, but, you know, we do what we can. So in, at the beginning, bread was probably a very simple flat bread that they just put hot stones, and they put it on top of the hot stones, and there you go, you got some bread. And that was that more was more digestible than the raw grain, so it was an improvement from the dietary point of view. And as you probably know, every civilization on the earth has flat breads. The Indians have naan, the Mexicans have tortillas, we have pancakes, uh, because that was the simplest and earliest form of bread. So. From then on, things started to evolve, and they learned more about what was happening. And they probably made a mistake one day and left some of the bread overnight, and in the morning it kind of grew, and not throwing it away, they baked it, and sure enough, it was better. And uh, that's how the whole thing evolved. Now, obviously, when you just had a fire to bake the bread, that was very primitive, but as the time evolved, they learned that if you build something around that fire to preserve the heat, you could also save wood, which was a commodity that was expensive. You had to go out and get it and fight the dinosaurs or whatever. And uh, so the oven appeared, rustic, but nevertheless an oven. And then the oven evolved and it moved from supporting one family to maybe supporting several families because it was an expensive thing to have. So why not share it? And it was the Romans during the Roman Empire that were responsible for taking the concept of the oven, making it better and distributed throughout Europe, all the way up to England. Okay, And of course, an oven has a certain size and they found out that you could support maybe 500 people out of one oven. And after that, they had to build another one. And at that time, the families took their turn being who, which family was in charge of the oven for, I don't know, several days. 
and people will bring in the grain already worked and a family was in charge of baking it. Of course, in time, what happened was that some people baked better than others. So the neighbors say, okay, pal, you bake my bread and I'll bring you some of the wheat for you. And then the concept of the bakery finally appeared. That baker was limited in what he could do with what he had in his hand, but it was the baker. But a very important concept also appeared. He became a very important person in the community because bread was a, a very important part of the diet. Uh, just stepping ahead, by 1800, a family in Berlin spent 44% of their income on bread. Imagine that nowadays. Oh, we, we eat a lot less bread now, but remember, the cathedrals, Notre Dame and Cologne and all that were built on bread. The lunch for a worker was bread and beer. Now, don't tell me, don't, don't, don't even think about how they went up those scaffolds, you know, <laughs> after two pints of beer. And maybe there were a lot of fatalities, but uh, that's basically how they got their nourishment. So th that important was bread. But then came, and of course, it was a lot of work kneading by hand and, and doing all that and grinding. The, not only kneading, you had to grind the, the grains and making the dough. And all of a sudden, the Industrial Revolution started and the steam engine started. And now they can put energy into, you know, the process of making the dough. And that was whew, for the baker. Finally could go home to sleep. And the Industrial Revolution also introduced new requirements onto the bread. Because it, doing it by hand is one thing, doing it in a machine is a different thing. It would get stuck, it would, you know, so you had to start conditioning that bread in order to be processed by mechanical means. Conditioning means starting to add things to it. And they found different things that would contribute to the bread, making it easier to machine, and therefore you get more bread faster. So, so that's how things started. And by early 1800s, uh, commercial yeast was discovered. And they found out that what was, what was making the thing grow. So commercial yeast was available. But before that, you know, there's not such a thing, there wasn't such a thing as San Francisco sourdough. It was just San Francisco bread. All bread was bread. Nobody, the, the word sourdough did not come up until the Klondike, final, final part of the 1800s. It was just bread. Everybody made bread the same way. But then several things happened. Not only did they understood the role of yeast, but also they found that baking soda could also leaven bread because it would chemically generate CO2, which was trapped by the matrix, and that was a little bubble, and that's why it grew in the heat and the bread rose. So the, a lot of the bread that we associate with really good bread, you know, during the, um, the exodus out west for the uh, gold rush and all that, and when they finally found San Francisco sourdough, and all that. It, it, imagine the baker in, in a wagon train. He didn't have much time. They stopped the train. He had to bake dinner and have bread for the cowboys ready. And sourdough, the long process, five, six hours. That was not very popular. But they found then that you can leaven the bread with baking soda and they can flavor it with the sourdough culture. And that's how a lot of the bread out west was done. Okay. So it wasn't until 
Fleischmann in middle 1800s came up with instant, basically, yeast that they could use, okay, which we know today. So that, that's more or less how things got there. But the issue is that in the process of making more bread in less time, they lost something along the way. They lost the flavor because it was the long time of making the bread that was responsible for developing flavor. And the basically instantaneous yeast that now you could have bread in an hour, it didn't give time. The, the topic of bread it started to become more complex and more complex. And chemists started to develop things to improve bread. Well, improve, quote, unquote, because improve meant easier to handle. It didn't mean more nutritious or better bread. And that's when things kind of took a left turn because uh, a lot of technology was developed to be able to make bread faster because that was more money, but not necessarily better. And someplace along the line, it started to become almost toxic, some of the things that we're adding, but they were making money. So this is more or less how things uh, evolved. So um, grain was first domesticated maybe 12, 13, 14,000 years ago, and from there to now, a lot of changes also happen on the grains that were being used for bread. And now there's a tendency to go to ancient grains once again. But don't forget that uh, up until the 1950s, 1960s, bread was pretty important as a part of diet in many parts of the world. And in 1961, Norman Porlag, with his Green Revolution, made a very important contribution to the world, which was took the productivity of a field from being able to make five or six bushels per hectare or per uh, acre. acre, sorry, per acre to about 35 bushels per acre. I mean, five to 35, that's huge. And of course, he's, he's credited with saving millions and millions of people in the poor countries. Yes. But that changed the grain. So the grain had to be stronger. The grain had to be uh, treated differently, etc. And that issue started to change the nature of bread. So as we look into the future to see if we're going to be eating bread, we need to learn from that experience of the evolution of bread in the past. Technology changes, changes things, sometimes for the better, but every technology that is designed or developed has its benefits, but it also has its costs. And sometimes the costs are higher than the benefits but the person that's getting the benefit is not paying for the cost. So, yeah, bread evolved, technology evolved, we can produce more bread. It became cheaper, quote unquote, relative, in relative terms, but it started to get away from being real bread. So, um, right around the middle 60s or so, the supermarket appeared in our economy, and it was a place you didn't you didn't go to the butcher and to the baker and to no no you went to the supermarket where everything was there. Go and shop right and see how many breads do they have for sale. Okay, so people changed the habits, and they wanted to have bread conveniently when they went shopping. 
that put a burden on the bread makers to make bread last longer. So we went from bread being something that you basically ate the same day or maybe the next. Nowadays, you have a piece of bread sitting on your counter for 30 days and it's still good. <laughs> bread was never meant to do that. And you should wonder what you're eating that can sit on the counter for... In fact, the design parameter for bakers is 21 days nowadays. And that changes the whole game. Because now it, they divorce bakers from consumers. So that's the effect of the supermarket in, in, in our lives. So changes in our habits set in and people no longer went to the bakery. I'm going for a piece of pie or something. But why? Everything was around. Yes, but you should read the label. You, should, you have so much stuff on a piece of bread now to make it last that long. They're almost atomic, nuclear. Okay, so it is us. The cost of that technology is our health. Nobody seems to be too concerned about that. So it's funny that at that time when all this was happening, after the war, particularly when it started to happen, some of the sensitivities and the dietary restrictions started appearing. Let me see if I can show you just one graph. This is the percentage of crops being sprayed before harvesting. Spring wheat, 97% gets sprayed. Winter wheat, 61%. During wheat, 99%. Why is it sprayed? Well, because they found out that if you spray it right before you harvest it, the plant not only dries out, which is easier to process in the mill, but also the plants are free because I'm here to propagate and I've died. So if you just made it Amid a few more seeds, more yield, eight to ten percent. So nowadays in the U.S., as you see, it's a common practice for crops to be sprayed before harvesting. Yesterday I did a search in Google for the effects of uh, glyphosate, the component in Roundup, and I found that they are concerned because it kills birds kills fish, it kills bees, but they tell me that it doesn't kill humans. <laughs> At least not immediately. But that's happening nowadays. And when you look at the next, don't look like a coincidence to me. But the FDA says that it's okay. But what we're doing, we're finding out that it is not. Remember when tobacco was okay? So I think something similar is happening here. You see, the problem with a lot of people that have gluten sensitivities, is not the gluten. It's the fact that they've lost their capacity to process gluten because this herbicide inhibits the creation of a hormone, of a enzyme, sorry, or enzyme, that we need to digest gluten. But everybody blames the gluten because that's easier because a whole industry grew up to provide gluten-free. So it might not be the gluten at all, but I buy gluten-free, I'm okay, I'm safe. What we should be doing is demanding better bread. How do you demand better bread? With your money. Don't buy the bread that is not good for you. But how do you know? Well, this is what we're talking about here today. We're trying to find out how to do that. So the future of bread lies in its past. In recapturing bread as it should be, as a wholesome food that is good for you, that is, uh, has a lot of nutrients, and that is enjoyable. 
but that you what you're eating now in the supermarkets is not necessarily that at all. All you have to do is look at a, a label. A bread should have things we know, wheat, salt, maybe some grease, butter, oil, whatever, um, a grain of some kind, maybe even more than one grain, some water or some liquid, beer. Beer and bread are the same stuff. Only one has water and the other one doesn't. One has alcohol and the other one doesn't. But the components that go in there, they're exactly the same. But see, the difference is that the rest of the additives that are added to the bread to make it palatable, because nowadays you see it, yeah, they lost flavor because it's so fast there's no time to develop flavor. So what does a baker do? Adds flavor. You can buy bread flavor and you add it. Butter? No butter. I can buy a liquid that has the taste of butter and I add that in. And of course, sugar, everybody loves sugar. So if it doesn't taste too good, I add sugar. And that's what's happening. We are getting used to eating something which doesn't resemble good bread at all. So, okay. So if the answer to good bread is going back in time to the bread, bread the way it used to be made, that brings about the word sourdough because that's the way it was made. And unfortunately, in the U.S., the word we use is sourdough. It, may, it has got the implication that something didn't go right. It went sour. The, the, the French call it levain. Oh, so beautiful. It's levain. But it's, you know, it's funny. I, I, over the last few months, I've talked to a couple people that went to Europe that have gluten sensitivity is here, and they said, but I could eat the bread in Italy, and nothing happened to me. I was perfectly fine. I said, why do you think that is? Because in Europe, some of the bread's still being made the old-fashioned way. And it's not sitting in the supermarket waiting for somebody to buy it 20 days after it was made. So, so we need to understand if we're going to be eating sourdough bread or Levant bread, what the heck is that? So what is sourdough bread? Well, most people think of sourdough bread and they think of, you know, something like that, a round bowl. You know, it's, 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 in, the picture, it's in the front of every bread book you buy nowadays. How many Italians do we have here? Italian... Uh, you guys like panettone? Oh, who doesn't? Panettone is a sourdough bread. As a matter of fact, the best panettone is a, they're very proud of their culture. It, it dates generation to generation. How about um, cinnamon buns? Yeah. See, sourdough bread is not a type of bread. It is a process. You can make any bread using the sourdough process. And the difference is that in the fast bread, only yeast is used, and yeast is designed to be fast. But in sourdough, we have yeasts, and we also have bacteria contributing to fermentation. You say, ooh, bacteria, I don't want that. <laughs> no, no, good bacteria. Lactobacillus. The same ones that you find in milk. Babies need them to be able to digest. And that's what all sourdough culture is. It's a mixture of yeast, natural yeasts, not commercial yeast, and natural occurring bacteria. What are they? They're all around us every time we breathe. They're in the air. They're in the middle of the ocean, in the air. You can get a sourdough culture going very easily. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. And there's nothing but some bacteria and some yeast that they get used to living together 
They protect each other and they feed on each other because one produces enzymes, the other produces the sugar, and they know it, and they become stable. And the baker uses that through the bond and spread, the base is spread. And wow, you got sour the bread. Okay, fermentation is necessary for most breads to grow unless you're using a chemical agent like uh, baking dough, ba uh, sour baking soda or baking powder to grow it. The principle is the same. You need something in there that makes little bubbles that when heated up, expand like a balloon and make the bread grow. But nowadays, nowadays, it's gotten to the point when you buy that sandwich bread that your kids like so much with peanut butter and jelly, that is not even fermented anymore. They found that if they mix the bread in a high RPM machine, 1200 RPMs on up, like the Grand Prix cars, they can inject the air bubbles without having to ferment. And they go from flour to finish bread in a couple hours. It's inflated dough, but it ain't bread. <laughs> On the other hand, we're finding out that fermentation is a great thing. I mean, we all now drink kombucha because they're good for us. Tabasco sauce is fermented. Did you know that? I didn't either. Because fermentation contributes good things to flavor, to nutrients, etc. But then we go to the bread aisle and it ain't fermented at all. Well, so, okay, so sourdough is a process, it's not a bread. But not any process. And this is where the key that you have to learn is not all sourdough is sourdough. See, the industry is not regulated. I can throw a little bit a little bit of sourdough culture in my bread or a lot of sourdough culture and still call it sourdough. As a matter of fact, I don't even have to ferment it with sourdough. I can buy a bag of sourdough flavor. They've grown it, they dried it, they killed it, they packaged it, and you can add it to whatever the heck you're doing and call it sourdough. None of that is sourdough. The sourdough process needs to be slow to give time for the enzymatic action for the enzymes to transform the sugars and to give time for the bacteria and the yeast to eat the proteins. And which protein do you think is most likely to be in? The gluten. So in the sourdough process that you want to buy the bread is the long, cold, fermented sourdough. That means that fermentation takes place in the refrigerator at 38 to 42 degrees, not in the hot kitchen at 70 something. That one is fast. This one is slow. This one develops flavor. That one does not. So long fermentation is the one that gives you the true benefits. Very few people know, but there's scientific evidence that a sourdough bread left long enough to fully ferment, which may be 24, 36 hours, maybe even more, render gluten-free without the addition of any chemical. Because a lot of people say, you know, I can't eat gluten, so I go gluten-free. Yeah, but read the labels. What are you eating? <laughs> to make gluten-free bread palatable, you got to add a lot of things that are not necessarily good for you. So why not go back to the original, the original bread and buy good sourdough bread? Well, you won't find it in the supermarket. You got to go back to the bakery, particularly the bakeries that understand sourdough and do it right.
bread is a really healthy food. I mean, it has many advantages. It has a, a great nutrient profile. It has, it doesn't necessarily have to have high gluten, even if it comes from a high gluten um, mix. All you got to do is wait long enough. But waiting means cost. The refrigerator for two or three days occupied by bread, it's cost. But if people don't know what they're buying, they don't differentiate the cost of fast versus slow, therefore it's difficult for me to sell it. Organic is fantastic because it has no glyphosate at all. But look at it right now and what happened in the last year because of the pandemic. Flour basically duplicated, almost triplicated its cost. If I were to go and buy organic on top of that, it's another factor or two. And then I make some bread and I need to pay the bills. So I need to, I will have to sell it for so much that people say, you know, this is crazy. I'll just go to ShopRite. I'm, I'm crazy until you understand what you're buying. And nowadays you start to see people that come in to say, can you make me organic bread? Sourdough has a lot of things. For example, it natural preserves the bread. You know how bread is preserved nowadays? They, the number one additive is propionate, which is carcinogenous. And you can't use more than 45 parts per million. But tell me if you trust that somebody working in a bakery or someplace some guy, some guy back there in the middle of the night, he's tired. Is he going to be measuring with a micro scale what he's adding? He doesn't care. So the slightly acidic part of the bread, which is generated by the lactobacilli or the bacteria that produce acetic acid vinegar, inhibit growth of fungus because of the pH. So I don't have to add anything to make it so it doesn't go bad in two days. Um, but there's other problems that are solved that people don't even realize. Most people think the whole wheat flour, <laughs> it's better for you than white flour. What do you think? Why do they say that? They tell you, well, it's got more nutrients, it's got more vitamins, it's got more fiber, and all that stuff is good for you. Well, that's all true, until you find out how whole wheat flour is made. You see, now in modern times, ever since somebody in Philadelphia invented the steel mills, which are high-speed mills, compared to the stone mills, which were slow speed, of course, the yield it's much better, much faster, but it's done in rotating cylinders of steel, which get hot because of the friction. Heat kills all the vitamins. So at the end of the process, they put them back in artificially. That's why you, when you get a bag of flour, it says, you know, in parentheses, riboflavin, da, 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 they had to put it back in because the process killed it. Well, whole wheat is very interesting because whole wheat is made after they make white flour and they took out the shaft and they took out the, the, the bran and they took out, then they put it back in and call it whole wheat. That's how the whole wheat flour is. So you can't really buy wholesome whole wheat flour unless you go to a mill that specializes in that and does it slow. Again, slow, it's not going to cost a thing. Okay. But all the benefits, quote unquote, of whole wheat are gone. A little more fiber, sure, I'll take a tablespoon of metamucil and have good bread. What French breads do you know? Baguette's one, right? Which other French bread? Paris. 
croissant. Of course, a croissant and le baguette, neither of which is French. <laughs> Both are products of Vienna that went to Paris and became famous. Vienna was the baking center of Europe. That's where all the master bakers were. But as I said, you know, we're full of misinformation. We have come to decisions that nobody told us that was the case. Anyway, um, so there's something called phytic acid, which is in the brand of wheat. Phytic acid is also called the anti-nutrients. Why? Because it's a molecule that binds to vitamins and flushes them out. So you go to the supermarket or the drugstore and CVS and you buy a nice Centrum silver, right? Something like that. And you take that every day because you're, and then you eat whole wheat because you think that's the best and the whole wheat is killing the Centrum, flushing it out and you're back to where you started, minus 60 bucks. Semolina, yeah. well, it's, it's a type of wheat, right? And it's, Depends how you make it. It's the process that tells it how healthy it might be. The, the specs on semolina, and the, it, it's just protein and, and carbohydrates and basically all the same. But semolina is the, the type of gluten you develop is slightly different. That's why it's good for pasta, for example. Okay? It could be made good, but it depends on the baker. Okay? Are we beginning to see maybe? what I'm talking about here. Okay. So where are we today? Well, bread has been all but lost. We are eating a facsimile of bread, which is not necessarily good for us. The consumer is confused. And I don't blame him. In the hype of marketing, and brands and all that has created in our heads a concept that is not necessarily true. But it's an unregulated industry. So nobody's going to step in and do something different. As a matter of fact, in the U.S., there's only one bread that is regulated. Which one is it? You cannot call raisin bread, bread raisin bread unless it has a certain percentage of raisins. <laughs> Big deal. I don't even know what that percent is. I don't do it by percent. I do it by field. So that is some kind of raisin bread, but it's better for you than. So the company, the, the industry is regulated by the large companies, by the large brands, you know, and they tell us what, whatever they tell us long enough, we start believing it. Well, I think you should think about it a little bit. Bread nowadays is a very chemically complex entity. It doesn't have to be. So what's happening now? Now we know that we got here, we're confused. We don't even know how we got here. It's a miracle we survived. So what's in the future for us? Okay. Well, one thing we know. Back to basics is better. Back to when things were what they said they were. Well, because I made my bread, it's going to last two days. Maybe three. Not 21. Uh, not, not, not just that. Because also, I'm making with my hand or in small batches. But go to Philadelphia to uh, uh, Amoroso's. You see thousands of loaves being mixed and coming out continuously. That's a different story altogether. In, in that kind of environment, just a half of a percent change in the humidity is something that you have to worry about because they're high speed production lines. They, they test, for example, the wheat is tested before it goes in there because just a small variation in the protein content could throw the whole batch off. And unfortunately, 
those are the guys, not Amoroso, but the, the large guys that are dominating the market. And it's very difficult for the small baker to actually compete. But our product is totally different, as you can see. All those things in that table, maybe five ingredients. We can't hide it anymore. People are more conscious of what they eat. They're careful. So I think there's great future for bread because people will put pressure. And it doesn't matter if you, somebody's not buying your bread, it doesn't matter how fast I can make it. And also, and this is a, something I would highly recommend to you, we got to revive the village baker. Why? Because the baker that is conscientious about his people, he's guarding your health. When you buy a piece of bread from a baker in two days, it's green with, hey, go give the guy a hug. <laughs> he didn't lie to you. It's your fault that you didn't eat it. But it wasn't designed to be around. Okay. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you can get gluten-free bread out of wheat using the sourdough process. But it's a very expensive proposition for me to get a lab to measure how much gluten I have every batch. So I can't promise you that. I can promise you to be low in gluten. Okay? And I have many... Not many, but quite a few customers that are, have gluten sensitivities that can eat my bread. And every time they stray because they couldn't find me or whatever, they get into trouble again. So find your baker. Trust him. Talk to him. <laughs>
there's a reemergence of ancient grains. Yeah, ancient grains had less gluten to begin with. If you learn to work with them, they're great. A lot of them have great flavors. But you need gluten to make leavened bread from yeast or yeast dairy. You need that matrix to cap that balloon that captures the little bubbles that can stretch out and make a decent bread. Like It's like rye flour. It's a great flour with great flavor. But try to make a bread out of 100% rye flour. This shoe is easier to chew. <laughs> now, you have to be really good, really good to, to be able to do that. So there's been ch changes induced by the consumer. For example, we're changing the way wheat is being harvested. Nowadays, the good bakers, those village bakers that are more and more around in small bakeries, are demanding from the farmers, no glass of space for me, no, no Roundup. But not only that, here's my seeds. Plant these seeds for me. And no mills. I can now buy for a couple thousand dollars, I can buy a mill for my bakery. Yeah, it's not gonna produce three or four sacks an hour or anything like that, but it will give me flour that has not been touched by hot, heated cylinders and all that kind of stuff. It's difficult to work with. Why? Because it's not oxidized, because it's, it's young, and etc. But a, a good baker adjusts and you can work with that. And that's a tendency. There's a lot of new bakers milling in-house. So those are things, good things. Uh, so the, the local baker is re-emerging and it's usually a very specialized market. I mean, uh, this bakery specializes in these two or three types of bread and nature is wonderful. Nature created things which are amazing. When you sprout a seed, you start seeing changes in the components of that seed. For example, there'll be enzymes to convert starches into maltose because the little budding thing needs the maltose to grow for energy. Look, at the very molecular level, we all live on sugar. That's the only thing that we can digest. So our system is designed to break everything down into simple sugars that we can use. But nature was so smart that they made it with maltose because maltose is a complex sugar not easily eaten by yeasts. So even if the seed was with a lot of yeast around, the yeast couldn't eat it and therefore it was available for the plant to feed. Not great? Good, I'm finished. Now that we understand the benefits of the long process of the cold fermentation, we understand that it's not going to be as cheap, but we can't compete. Look, there's additives that make bread a lot more productive. And I'll go, somebody ask about uh, bleach. I'll get to that in a minute. There's something called ADA. An additive. Another one called datum. It's another additive. Those things can generate 30 to 40 percent more yield. In other words, more air. So my pound of flour gives me more volume of bread. Therefore, I can make more money. A sourdough baker cannot compete straight on, just because of that 30 percent. That's a lot. So you need to understand, and you need to understand what you're getting. Air, you're paying for air. The first one of the, when, when you're going, when a baker goes to buy flour, yeah. the first choice he has 
is am I going to buy bleach or unbleached flour? Uh, the next one is bromated or unbromated. So why is that? Well, because the mills are adding bleach. <laughs> you know what bleaching is. You do it at home in the laundry. You add a bleaching agent. Why? Because it makes bigger bread. It's that bromide. Why? Because it makes it bigger bread. Okay. So I would say, as a recommendation, find yourself a baker. Befriend a baker. Heck, buy him a drink every once in a while. Read the label. Particular in breads. Read the label. It's got more than six ingredients. Find something else. Well, because whole wheat, remember what I said? It's white flour. They add the bran. They add the germ. What does the germ have? Well, the germ has oils. And oils become rancid. So if you're buying whole wheat, make sure it's relatively fresh. Three months is fine. Four months is fine. White, it could be seven, ten months. It doesn't matter. But buy, take it home, put it in your fridge. So it doesn't go rancid on you. Because rancid is bad, not only taste, but bad for you. Okay? So that as you're learning more about bread, like, you know, don't put it in the fridge, put it in the freezer then you can really have a life enjoying bread to the fullest. And there's very few things in life better than, I mean, just this morning when I baked this stuff, I'm, I still get thrilled every time I open the oven. I mean, I put in there some white stuff that was ooky and sticky, and look what came out. And the, ah, the aroma. That's what bread is. Bread is a transformational food. That's why it's so important in religions, because it represents transformation. It went in at something and it came out of something totally different. The uh, water is important for bread for two reasons, just like for Scotch whiskey. You know, uh, maybe some flavor. I doubt if. 99.9% .9 of people can tell the difference. But the amount of minerals in it, it's important to the yeast because it enhances or impedes fermentation. So New York water has a particular profile of chemistry that benefits the type of fermentation you use for bagels. But it's not a property of the water. It's a property of the minerals dissolved in the water. And if you don't have it, you can buy a pill, dissolve it in the stupid thing, and you get in your water. OK? So it is important, but not, it's not the difference. The, the main difference in kneading has to do with what we call the absorption ratio. How much water to flour the recipe calls for? Water, I said no, liquid to flour. Okay? Different uh, mixing techniques are used according to how much water there is. Water for bread can vary between, I would say, 52% all the way to 100%. Means equal amounts of flour and water. It's hell making bread with that, but. It can be made. But depending on that, a lot of the properties of the dough will be coming from that and whether it has oil or not. So how much to knead and what kneading technique I use depends on the recipe. I can't give you a general, you know, it depends on the recipe. Some recipes, for example, excuse me, that um, where you need to make a very hydrated dough, like if you're making ciabatta, 80% water. Well, you put it on the mixer, it ain't gonna go anywhere. 
It's just going to be a group. So there's techniques to do that. You start with less um, water, and once you get the gluten going, you start adding the water slowly, okay? Or you sit it for a long time. Gluten can be developed by two ways. One is by me. The other one is by opening a bottle of wine and waiting. <laughs> I recommend the second. Because <laughs> gluten will form irregardless. The minute you mix dough, uh, flour, and a liquid, gluten will begin to form. Kneading just accelerates that process. Okay. But if you don't like kneading, there's a book, uh, bread in five minutes a day or something. You mix the two, you put it in the fridge. You come back next morning, gluten is formed. And it will last you four or five days. So you can take, make two sandwiches or whatever. You can, you can do that. Once a baker knows what the heck he's doing, you find that it's a very flexible media. I could just about interrupt my baking process or my kneading process anywhere, use a refrigerator to slow things down until I'm ready. And that's why very few people realize that the refrigerator is more important in the baker than the oven. Because it allows the baker time to react, time to go home and see the wife. That, you know, that, you know. Well, gluten is not in the flour, but it's formed from the flour by the addition of water or some kind of liquid and energy. And all it's doing is there's two proteins in the flour, gliadin and glutamine, that they have to get together to form gluten. Different grains have different proportions of these things. Okay, um, a high gluten flour, it's not the flour that has the gluten, it has the potential to develop a high gluten. And that's why you see differences when you buy all purpose flour, which is basically it's a flour in the middle designed for most things, but you know, not good for anything in particular. Or you have pastry flour, we at the bottom, you know, less than seven to eight percent of protein. Bread flour, 13 or so higher up protein. All-purpose flour, 11% protein. That just tells you basically the potential of gluten development for that flour and how much you have to work to get the bread. Also, it determines also the absorption of that flour, how much water it needs to add. The, the higher the protein, the more water you need to add it to get a decent, you no, know, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not going to give you a class of how to do that here. But it, the, all those are interrelated terms. So if you're going to make a cake, cake flour, 8 9% of protein. If you're going to make a sourdough, 13%. A sourdough starter has to be fed up with a periodicity depending on the conditions that it's being kept to keep the culture alive. I have a sourdough starter that dates to 1847, and it's still alive. I also have one which is from Barnegat Light, uh, from the woods there. And that's important because that means that the bugs that he has are the same ones we have in our gut. So he pre-digests stuff for you and makes all that stuff is palatable. But it depends on your usage. You should not let it go more than six days without feeding it, okay? To feed it, you throw away most, you keep flat, and you add water and flour, and you let it grow again. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.